Greetings subscribers and other curious persons and welcome to another vlog inspired by the Goodreads Tuesday Talks group. This week I'm talking about favourite antagonists in fiction. Now, when I originally started thinking about this topic, I was going to record a video about not having any favourite antagonists. But it struck me this morning when I remembered the other third of my favourite reading genres that I do have a favourite antagonist. But the reason I didn't is because probably my favourite section of fiction is the Cthulhu Mythos. And whilst there are outliers on it that are more splatterpunk or rubber monster or surrealism, what I like particularly about the mythos is the cosmic dread. The, the obstacle people are meeting as protagonists is that the universe is fundamentally not a comfortable place for humanity. Not because the universe hates humanity, but because the universe doesn't care either way. That bits of the universe don't fit together in a way that makes sense to the way that humans fit together. So to comprehend the universe too much is to go mad. That there are creatures that destroy humans, but they do it in the same way that we might use flea spray or block up a hole that ants are getting in through. Not because of a fundamental hatred or a desire to exterminate a particular kind of insect, but because it's something we do. We've noticed something that's imperfect and we've fixed it. Some of the mythos entities, even it might be that they destroy without noticing. So instead of using flea spray, you happen to tread on an ant. You don't notice. And so it's the heroes dealing with this massive obstacle that the universe is ill-fitted to human life. But it's how they deal with it not making sense, rather than there being any specific antagonist. So whilst there are antagonists, Cthulhu amongst them, they don't really act in that way. And so my favourite bits of the mythos aren't the ones that have one of the big gribblies, because I have a favourite big gribbly. They're the ones where it's got this sense of how do you cope with a universe that is going, and now it's time for this to happen. And we're like the dinosaurs with the asteroid bearing down on us, mostly unknowing and unable to do anything if we do know. <coughs> and that's my second big chunk of reading is the Warhammer, both 40k and fantasy. But again, that's about a very brutal, dark universe. Most of the stories are quite militaristic. So it's either a unit of people fighting in war or a small bunch of heroes fighting against a very dangerous environment. So again, there isn't a specific antagonist there. So much the fact that the universe isn't comfortable for humans. And the quote-unquote good guys 
exist as usually people who follow a particularly fanatical religious viewpoint. So it's hard to tell who are the good guys and the bad guys. Again, there's not really a strong antagonist there. Then, as I was sitting down to record this video, it occurred to me that I'd managed to completely forget also that the third thing that I seek out when I'm at the library is vampire books. I like books with vampires in. I like films with vampires in. I like almost anything with vampires in. And whilst I don't love every interpretation of the vampire, I do like stories where the vampires are the bad guys. Potentially more than I like stories where the vampires are the heroes. So I read paranormal romance, urban fantasy and so on, but I like a traditional vampire story, as it were, where a bunch of humans discover this predatory beast and try to deal with it. But my favourite of all of them is Dracula, because he is the predatory beast. He is an antagonist. He's trying to infiltrate British society to kidnap young women to build an empire of the vampire. But he's more than just a cipher. Whatever people have written about what Dracula really means, how it reflects epidemiology, Stoker's fascination with this, Stoker's fear of that, these social trends, that it still has this, that and the other, he has a dark nobility to him. He isn't a good virtuous man, he isn't decent or honourable in the way that we understand, but he has a consistency and a character, and, which I think is but also a sorrow to him which is probably summed up best for me by a short speech from Shadow of the Vampire, the Willem Dafoe film about the making of Nosferatu, where Dafoe's character playing the vampire is talking about why Dracula is for him such a sad book and says that Dracula hasn't had servants in 400 years and then a man comes to his ancestral home and he must convince him that that he is like the man he has to feed him when he himself hasn't eaten food in centuries can he even remember how to buy bread how to select cheese and wine and then he remembers the rest of it how to prepare a meal how to make a bed he remembers his first glory, his armies, his retainers, and what he is reduced to. The loneliest part of the book comes when the man accidentally sees Dracula setting his table. And that, I think, is at the heart of what I love about vampires as antagonists, and Dracula particularly, that they are humans and drink blood. Not all vampires in all vampire media are like that, but usually they're a human being who's been transformed. They have this struggle within them and potentially over time they come to an accommodation with it. But you can be the human and be constantly stressed about needing to drink blood to live which would batter away at your humanity or you can be the monster but there's still the voice in the back of your head 
that stopped you doing horrific things when you were alive, that's still going to have the same goals. So trying to drown it in blood isn't necessarily going to work. So you've got the struggle of how you cope with what you've done. Or you've got Dracula's response, which is to draw back. At the start of the book, he's practically asleep. He's doing very little. And depending on which version of the film you see, sometimes they show that. In the Francis Ford Coppola one, he's an old man at the start. And he becomes youthful as society interacts with him. So it's not the drinking blood, it's the need of a human life in the sense of spiritual, emotional, mental force. That they need not just to eat, because we all need to eat, but they need this social component that protects them against the worst collapse into madness by reminding them of their humanity, while also being their food source. It's as if we could only eat food after we'd had a conversation with it. So almost the opposite of the restaurant at the end of the universe, where instead of food that wants to be eaten, we'd have to interact with our food to the extent that we'd acknowledged it had a right to exist and to not be eaten. So it's that the ways that vampires resolve that dichotomy between knowing there is a spiritual component and needing to feed that makes them my favourite antagonist. Toodaloo!